America is suffering from a sickness, and not just coronavirus. The greater illness, the one that threatens our entire society's survival, is the denial of reality itself. Just look at the headlines from around the country today. In Texas, we're now learning a former Houston police captain forced a motorist off the road at gunpoint in October and accused him of ferrying 750,000 stolen election ballots in his van. But that driver was an air conditioning repairman and all his van contained was spare parts. According to court documents, the former cop was allegedly paid more than $200,000 to look into election fraud by a Texas organization called the Liberty Center for God and Country. That organization is run by a Republican power broker and radio host who also sued his county over its COVID mask mandate. A strain of this same sickness appeared this week in Kansas, where the Republican mayor of Dodge City abruptly resigned her post over threats of violence after she voted in favor of a mask mandate last month. They contained verbiage that is, in my eyes, just very inappropriate and, and very threatening. Words such as, we're coming for you, murder, you'll burn in hell. And I just got to the point where I thought, and my family particularly said, enough's enough. I know they're only words, but who's to say they wouldn't follow up with actions? These are the symptoms of our profound illness, the sites of its inflammation. But where does it originate? In our nerve center, the White House, of course. Former top officials of the CDC telling the New York Times today that the Trump administration's effect on the agency's scientific research and disease fighting was much worse than we ever knew. They say their work had to accommodate edits from White House aide and noted scientific brain Kellyanne Conway, as well as presidential's daughter and renowned scholar Ivanka Trump. One of those former CDC officials telling the Times, quote, every time that the science clashed with the messaging, messaging won. Finally, this malady, the reality denial disease, was on display today in evidence uncovered by a congressional panel investigating how the White House's coronavirus response was politicized to be anti-science. That evidence shows that a top Trump appointee at the Department of Health and Human Services, Paul Alexander, told other officials that he wanted the disease to spread widely among, quote, infants, kids, teens, young people, young adults, middle-aged with no conditions, etc. writing, we use them to develop herd. We want them infected. Those are real quotes. The report adds, quote, the views expressed in these private communications were later echoed by President Trump because of course they were. We're all being held at the mercy, not just of COVID, but of this disease of reality denial inflicted on us by Republicans. Can we as a society defeat it? Or has it already spread too far for too long? Joining me now is Olivia Troy, Republican former aide to the White House Coronavirus Task Force, and now an outspoken critic of the Trump administration's COVID response. Uh, Olivia, thanks so much for coming back on the show. There's a ton of things I want to ask you about, but the first has to be this quote, we want them infected. That's Paul Alexander in a July email to other HHS officials. In the same thread, Alexander said, quote, if it is more infectious now, the issue is who cares? We must go on with life. 300,000 Americans are dead. Uh, your former colleagues are now responsible for killing more people than the engineers at Chernobyl by putting politics before science. Well, first, many thanks for having me. I love watching your show, um, so I appreciate the invite uh, to join you tonight. Um, I, you know, I appreciate your reporting. But you know, when I saw that article today, I've got to tell you, I I was physically ill reading it. I got physically sick to my stomach, and it brought back a lot of moments. I would say back in around the June and July timeframe, where I really was very confused, to be honest, about a lot of the stuff that started happening. And I was questioning what was going on. And I remember sitting in these task force meetings repeatedly with people like Dr. Fauci and credible experts saying that this concept does not work. And we thought that we put it to rest. Honestly, it was tabled. We thought that it was not moving forward. And I don't think that Dr. Burks or Dr. Fauci would have ever yeah. advocated for this thing. And so to read it today yeah. was just appalling. Mm. I mean, I just, uh, you know, uh, I, appalling every day indeed. I got up to work. And then I, you know, open that article today and say, so this is really, this is the reality of what was really happening behind these closed doors and the strategy 
and you have an entire group of people who is actively trying to undermine everything that some of the people who were trying to do the right thing, we were never going to win with this. Right. And we have 300,000 Americans yeah. dead now. And there's no excuse. Indeed. And it. along with that report, uh, Olivia, Olivia, I want to throw another report at you, the one I mentioned just a moment ago. There's the Times reporting uh, from those CDC officials saying COVID policies were getting edits from Ivanka Trump and Kellyanne Conway. I mean, it's beyond parody. It's, it sounds like something out of an SNL skit, but it's actually real life and people died. So I'm just wondering, you were in the room in the coronavirus task force working for Mike Pence. Did you ever hear people say, we want them to get infected? Did you ever have stuff from Kellyanne Conway or Ivanka Trump telling you to change things? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I know Kyle and Amanda really well. I worked very closely with them. I probably spoke to Kyle every single day, to be honest with you. And I'm well familiar with the events that they're talking about. I remember the changing of the church guidelines. I remember the language being removed. I remember being on late night calls where people from OMB who really honestly had no business uh, doing anything with these guidelines were changing verbiage and removing it. And I remember Kelly Ann Conway weighing in on the church guidances. They wanted to get the people back in churches. Everything was going back to normal. And nothing that the CDC people could do, like Kyle and Amanda, was going to stop that from happening, no matter how hard they tried. Yeah. And just talking, you mentioned the desire to get back to normal, especially early on. I also have to ask, you work directly under Vice President Mike Pence. Um, Jonathan Swan of Axios was first to report that Pence uh, will take the COVID vaccine on Friday. Uh, he wants it televised live to instill public confidence, which is all good. But back in June, while you were still working for him, Pence published an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. The headline was, there isn't a coronavirus second wave. Uh, the vice president writing, quote, the media has tried to scare the American people every step of the way, and these grim predictions of a second wave are no different. Uh, he was completely, utterly, tragically, disastrously wrong. Were you involved in that op-ed? Did you advise him against it? Mehdi, yes, I was involved in that op-ed. I was tasked to work on it, and I was told to work on it with another staffer. Uh, who struggled with me to figure out how we were gonna do this when we were watching rising cases. And we did push back, uh, but we were overruled uh, by the vice president's chief of staff who really wanted this published. And in the end, it moves forward. And the following week, we had a very big spike in cases. And with the data that Dr. Brooks was briefing in these task force meetings, it was ludicrous to have this request happening. And I'll, and I'll say this, reading that article today, where it talks about that June, July timeframe, things got really hard and I could not figure it out. And I think that that was the beginning of this decision apparently that was made and everything starts to shift that direction. So that op-ed is in line mm -hmm. with what that article is basically saying. And so, I just don't have any more words for what that says about how much these people did not care about Americans and what was happening here. Indeed. So on, so on that note, you mentioned them not caring, and you, of course, then later resigned and you've spoken out since. But I have to ask, you take that Wall Street Journal op-ed from Pence, you take the reporting today in Congress, we want them infected. You take the CDC saying, these officials saying, Kellyanne Conway is telling us what to say, not the science. When you look back at that period, this evidence, do you believe uh, that your former boss, Donald Trump, your former boss, Mike Pence, have blood on their hands? Yes. There's no way that you can allow this to happen for as long as it did. There are people saying goodbye to their loved ones via nurses and doctors to distill today. You can't live with a clear conscience right now and say you did everything you did to stop this virus and to protect Americans. Look, the evidence is there. Yeah. It's all there. And, you know, it's going to continue to come out. The truth will continue to come out. And it's a shame that this was the administration that was in charge right now on this pandemic response. I mean, it didn't have to be this way. I hope you're right about the truth. 
I hope you're right about the truth. We're almost out of time. I was going to ask you about Mike Pompeo's uh, Christmas indoor parties, uh, but there's just too much nonsense and chaos coming out of his administration. We simply can't cover all of their COVID catastrophes. Let me end by asking you this very briefly. There's a picture of Dr. Anthony Fauci on the wall behind you. I saw that last time I spoke to you. He's in line to become chief medical advisor to the president, to Joe Biden. Uh, how's he going to cope with that job and covering COVID? And he's not the youngest of men. You know, Dr. Fauci, he will soon be turning 80 this month, and he is a brilliant mind. And the thing about him is that he speaks the truth very honestly at whatever cost. And I think that I am grateful that the Biden administration will be utilizing him in the way that he should have been utilized and supported from day one of this pandemic, because I certainly saw him be muzzled at times and disregarded and publicly discredited right and he is really a national treasure that we are lucky to have and i'm grateful that he will continue to serve and we need people like him uh to have that platform yeah. and to advise yeah he is a national treasure, and yet he has to travel with 24-hour armed guards uh, because of the president's rhetoric. Olivia Troy, as ever, thank you for joining us, and thank you for your insights. Hi, I'm Mehdi Hassan. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more of the Mehdi Hassan show by clicking on any of the videos on this screen, and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thank you for watching.